Okay, here's chapter four of Sylvia and Aki. This one is Aki. So this one's from Aki's point of view, back before Sylvia and her family moved in. Aki, Westminster in Santa Ana, California. The day after Aki hid her doll and began her final packing, she came home from school to find her mother standing at the sink, slicing cabbage for korok, Japanese croquettes. Aki dropped her book bag on the dining room table and went into the kitchen to get a glass of water. Remember, they were packing because they have to leave because of um, the Japanese internment um, act. Her mother didn't look up. She didn't say welcome home or how was your day. She stood silently, chopping and re-chopping the greens. For a moment, there was only the faint crunch of cabbage leaves on the cutting board. When she stopped... Aki saw her mother wipe her cheek with the back of her hand. What is it? Aki asked. It's pop, her mother said, her voice breaking. <clears throat> she cleared her throat and started again. He's been taken to a camp. She spoke in a whisper so sad and so faint that Aki could hardly hear. What? He was taken to a camp, her mother repeated. When? Several men came for him this morning after you left for school. As if from very far off, Aki heard the rush of water pouring down the sink and the smelled the open bottle of sesame oil on the counter, the loose hair at the nape of her mother's neck, the blade of the knife in the white sink, the texture of her mother's dress, the light blue one with the white piping at the collar, all came into focus, sharp focus, like a snapshot of this moment that she would never be able to forget. Aki didn't know how long she hesitated before saying, I thought we were going to be together. I did too. Her mother wiped her cheek again. And we will be. When? Aki repeated, I don't know. I don't know exactly when, but he will be back. Her mother's gr voice grew stronger as she spoke. Now tears flowed down Aki's face and she let them. Her mother pulled her close. Aki put her arms around her mother's tiny waist and they leaned into each other, holding each other up. She whispered, I didn't get to say goodbye. The realization struck her like a slap. It's an interesting image. So like her realization of it is so strong, it feels like it actually physically hits her. The realization struck her like a slap. Her father was gone and she hadn't been able to hug him or tell him, I love you. No goodbyes, her mother said, her voice firm now. No sayonaras. At that moment, Aki could imagine what her father would say if he were there. He would pat her on the shoulder and say, be strong. She could find strength in that. Did I see him in the kitchen this morning? What were his last words to me? She wanted a perfect picture of him, a picture of him in her mind to hang on to, but her mind was blank. I miss him already, Aki whispered. I do too, her mother said. Aki and her mother were quiet for a while. I still don't understand, Aki finally said. Why did they come just for pop? They took some of the men first, her mother said. Newspaper reporters, teachers, businessmen like pop. Men they thought might be a threat. A threat? Aki echoed. Pop isn't a threat to anyone. If he is, then why didn't they take all of us? Aren't we all threats? I know, I know, her mother said, but the people who make the rules don't know. They are scared of anyone who is Japanese. Even us? Even us. Aki's mother shook her head. What about Seiko? At age 17, Seiko's older brother was almost a man. Ever since he was a little boy, he had helped his father run the farm, going with his father to the bank to translate back and forth between Japanese and English. He'll be with us at a different camp, Aki welcomed the small bit of good news. We will be leaving in a couple days, Aki's mother said, for a place called Poston in Arizona. Poston, I actually don't know if it's Poston or Poston. Poston, Aki thought, the word on the luggage tag of the two small suitcase. Remember when she was packing her suitcase and she had the two tags that she was allowed to use? That's where she saw the word poston before. That night, Aki tossed and turned, walk, waking before dawn, feverish and thirsty. 
She called for her mother, who entered the bedroom and turned on the overhead light. The brightness hurt, and she had to squint until her eyes adjusted to the glare. Her mother's eyes were swollen and red. Aki wondered whether her mother had slept all night or if she had spent the night crying. Are you sick? Aki's mother asked. Let me look at you. She felt Aki's face and neck and then lifted her nightgown. Oh no, her mother said. Aki's legs and torso were covered in tiny red spots as if she had been attacked by a swarm of hungry mosquitoes. Chicken pox. Sorry, I lost my place because my phone is going crazy over there. Why now? Can you imagine a worse time to get chicken pox? You're about to move to some place you don't want to move to, and now you're sick. Ugh. Aki had hoped to get chicken pox the year before when several of her friends came down with it and got to stay at home from school for a couple weeks. Aki didn't want to be sick now. She didn't want to give her mother anything more to worry about. What will happen to me? Aki asked. You must not scratch, her mother said. Let me get a thermometer and lotion for the itching. You can have an oatmeal bath in the morning. An oatmeal bath means you put oatmeal actually in the bathtub and it's supposed to be helpful for itchy skin. Oh, it's kind of like being breakfast cereal. But Aki couldn't help asking again, what's going to happen to me? You'll be fine in a week or two, her mother said. No, what's going to happen to me when you leave for camp? Aki's mother stared at her for a moment. Her face sagged. I don't know, she said. I'll find out what to do about that in the morning. Aki tried not to scratch. At least we have something new to think about instead of pop and packing for poston. Aki heard her mother rummaging around in the bathroom medicine cabinet. She returned with calamine lotion and dabbed it on the reddest spots. Soon the itching stopped long enough for Aki to fall asleep. When Aki finally awoke in the morning, her mother was leaning over her. How are you feeling? Itchy, Aki said, really itchy. Aki's mother began to fold the blanket on the end of the bed. I'm afraid there isn't much time. She looked at Aki and then at the suitcase next to the bed. I talked to the man at the civil control station. I asked if we could stay until you were better, she said, but he said, no, we have to go now. But I'm sick. You must go to the hospital in Santa Ana, and Seiko and I must go ahead to Poston. They don't want the chicken pox to spread all through the camp. I have to go to the hospital? By myself? Aki knew she sounded like a whiny baby, but she couldn't help herself. First pop then, first pop gone, now even more separation. She reached for her mother's hand. Don't be afraid, Aki's mother said. In the hospital, the nurses will bring you food on a tray so that you can eat it in your bed. Aki knew that her mother was trying to put on a cheerful face for her, and silently she resolved, I will try to be happy, Mom, for you. But all she really wanted to do was have her father back, to stay on the farm, to go back to school, to have things the way they'd been before the evacuation. But what I want doesn't matter. That afternoon, when the front door clicked shut behind her, Aki knew she was leaving behind everything that was familiar and comfortable. It was as though she were walking away from her life. So remember, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Aki and her family were told that they were going to have to leave their farm. And that's the farm where Sylvia and her family are staying in the other part of the story. Aki's mother set the suitcase next to the empty bed in the hospital room. Aki looked over at the Japanese girl in the next bed. Sorry, there's a cat walking in front of me. This does not normally happen in our read-alouds in the classroom. She could tell by the red splotches on her roommate's face and arms that she had chicken pox too. The girls greeted each other while Aki's mother unpacked some of the items. Me. Unpacked some of the items from the suitcase. When her mother could find nothing more to do, she said, well, I better let you two girls get some rest. Aki felt her stomach flutter. Aki's mother put her arms around her and held her close. She didn't say goodbye. I will see you soon. Then she leaned over and kissed Aki on the top of her head and whispered in her ear, Gaman, the Japanese word for be brave, be strong. 
I have no idea if I said it correctly. Aki looked up at her mother with tears in her eyes. Her mother's eyes were wet too. I will not cry. I will not cry. I will not cry. Aki chanted to herself. I will not embarrass my mother, not in front of strangers. Aki's mother let her go, and Aki felt her mother's strength fade. Do you want to play checkers? Aki's new roommate, Yuki, asked before Aki's mother had even left the room. Aki tried to make her voice sound cheerful. Okay. My guess is she's not feeling very cheerful. As Yuki began to set up the game on one of the bedside tables, Aki strained to hear the sound of her mother's heels striking the linoleum floor in the hall. She listened long after the footsteps had faded away. Which camp are you going to? Yuki asked. Post on. Me too! Yuki divided the checkers into piles of red and black. My family has already gone. What have they told you about it? Nothing, the girl said. She stacked the checkers to make sure the piles were even and all the pieces were there. I just got here yesterday. My mother says we'll find out when we get there. Maybe we'll be neighbors, Aki said. I hope so, said Yuki. Do you want red or black? It doesn't matter. Yuki turned the board so that the red checkers were on Aki's side. Let's play. Aki and her new friend spent the next two weeks playing games, reading and drawing pictures of themselves covered with red spots. For Aki, the quiet nights when there was nothing to distract her, those were the hardest. She tried to convince herself that nothing had changed, that she would go home to find Seiko and her parents sitting around the dining room table. But deep inside, she knew it wasn't true. Once she recovered from the chicken pox, she wasn't going home. Her father wasn't waiting for her. In the dark hospital room, Aki would think these things and cry silent tears, private tears, the kind that left no trace except for a wet spot on the pillow that dried that the morning before that dried before morning a nurse accompanied aki on the long train ride out to poston soldiers wearing tan uniforms and carrying duffel bags waited on the platform as the train pulled away they each have one bag aki noticed only what they can carry isn't this exciting the nurse said you'll be able to see your parents soon aki nodded and gave a tight-lipped smile. A tight-lipped smile means um, kind of a stressed out smile. It's not a happy smile. It's a smile you have to give as opposed to a smile that you feel. Aki nodded and gave a tight-lipped smile, not pop. The nurse reached for the Saturday evening post and soon settled into reading her magazine. Sorry, the cat again. The cat's not leaving us alone. Aki gazed out the window, watching the lush green of the California growing country of the California growing country turn into the dry, dusty, bleak Arizona desert. Who can live out here? When the train pulled into the station, Aki hungrily searched faces in the crowd on the platform, looking for her mother. Aki didn't trust her eyes at first. Her mother was standing on the platform, weeping. Aki had never seen her mother cry in public before. Why do you think she's crying? Do you think she's crying because she's sad? Or do you think she's crying because she's just overcome with relief at Aki finally getting there? What has Poston done to her? Aki wondered as fresh fears crowded her imagination. The train squealed to a halt and passengers rushed and began to collect their belongings. The nurse took Aki's suitcase in one hand and Aki's hand in the other and together they made their way out into the crowd. As soon as Aki saw her mother again, she broke free and rushed to her. They clung to each other, forcing the horde of strangers to flow around them. She felt her mother's soft hands stroking her hair, and she let herself how much, feel how much she had missed her. Then Aki said again goodbye to the nurse, picked up her suitcase, and took her mother's hand. She missed her father. She missed her home. She missed the life she used to have, but when she felt her mother's hand in hers, she knew that she was ready to face Poston. And that is the end of chapter four. And the next chapter is chapter five, and it's Sylvia. So it'll go back to Sylvia's perspective. Okay, remember to go ahead and um, from Google Classroom, 
record your question or comment about this chapter next to your name on the spreadsheet. Make sure you click over to the tab for chapter four so that it's not on chapter three. Okay, see you guys in class meeting.